Hey guys, thanks for coming back for part two. Um, I hope you enjoyed part one. Enjoyed is a relative term, I get that. Um, but in that part one, we kind of talked about some of the events where sanitation went wrong in a disaster. We also talked about the effect of hydrogen sulfide if your pea traps in your home dry up in a large event. So now I want to talk to you about some other dangers beyond your pea traps drying up. Um, what we're going to have is a community that is immediately trying to respond to a large scale or a large disaster in which they've lost water and wastewater. Uh, people in your community are going to try to solve that problem immediately, right? We can live for days without food. We shouldn't, we don't want to, we prepare so that we don't have to. Um, but if you lose water and wastewater, you've got an immediate problem that you have to solve and people are going to start solving it. Now, your first responders are always training to bring up shelters and to bring up hospitals and to set up a proper sanitary environment there. My concern is that in your communities, residents are going to try to solve this problem on their own and they make some assumptions when they're planning that are a little off base and can cause an outbreak of illness. So let's talk about what some of those things are. First of all, the pit latrine, right? Everybody says, I can dig a hole. My own father said to me, you cannot tell me I cannot dig a hole. We call it a pit latrine. So people think, well, we'll be fine in an event. I'm going to dig a hole and we'll kick some dirt on it. Um, they're really off base with this. Now, first of all, why do they think that? Um, well, they think it because it actually, it works. So when I was young, my poor dad had three daughters and he just took us everywhere camping and hunting. And we did a lot of what we call dry camping, right? Has anybody had this lovely experience? You go somewhere camping and there's no facilities. There's no toilets or outhouses. So what do you do? You go away from camp a little ways, you dig a hole, maybe put a nice little privacy surround around it, set it up beautifully. My dad always worked very hard to make sure his daughters were comfortable. So anyways, it's called a pit latrine and it's away from camp. And it worked. Uh, however, the reason that it worked is the fact that you're with what? If you're doing it right, six to eight people, okay? You're on 100,000 acres of land. That mountain, you're almost alone on it, right? Thousands of acres. And the other reason why it worked is the fact that you left. You stayed there for a week or maybe even 10 days. And what you didn't see is when the scary humans leave, the vermin and the animals, they get in there and they dig it up. They can smell it. Sometimes it happens while you're there. We had it happen. The foxes came and dug up our hole one time while we were there. You, when you leave that area, the animals dig it up. They make a huge mess. They eat it. It's disgusting. It's a really nasty situation a lot of the time. But we don't see that part because we left, right? Um, if that, it just doesn't translate to a suburban environment. So let's say we have a large scale event or disaster, flooding, earthquake, land movement, whatever it may be. And people are trying to stay in their homes that are structurally sound and they are burying human putrefied waste in their backyards. Now I don't know about where you live, but where I live it's average of uh, less than a third acre lots. Uh, they're starting to build eight acre lots. We've got townhomes, we've got condos, apartment buildings. What are those people going to do? But those that have these, let's say you have a third acre lot. I don't care if you have a whole acre lot. If you're trying to stay in your home and you are digging holes in your backyard and filling them with putrefied human waste, you're going to bring in the vermin that carry disease. Your own domesticated cats and dogs, they're coming in and they're digging up your hole. And they're going to make a huge mess and then they're going to take it into your home. The rats, the skunks, the cats, the dogs, anything that's digging in a putrefied waste. Putrefied waste is when urine is mixed with solid waste. It's putrefied. And it's more toxic than anything else on the planet. You do not have the ability to deal with it. It's also creating a giant sinkhole in your backyard with the moisture, right? A putrefied sinkhole. Imagine if this happens in the middle of summer, the insects that won't come in. Insects kill a million people a year with vector-borne illnesses. And that's during a normal time when we're doing mitigation. But if we have a population of people in their backyards burying human waste, putrefied human waste, digging pits of it and trying to stay in their home, it's going to bring vermin, it's going to bring in insects, that brings disease. We also have a problem of sustainability. How many holes are you going to dig? The water companies like we talked about in part one, they're going to be weeks to months before they can recover your water and wastewater system. How many holes are you going to dig? How much room do you have? How much disease is that going to bring? It's a really big problem. And people will say, well, the pioneers did it, right? I live out west. Everybody knows pioneers did. They came, they built outhouses, they buried their waste. You're right. Well, uh, they're kind of right. 
So what they did was they hired teams of men to dig those holes on their property that were very deep, okay? It was a dangerous job. They dug them 20, 30, 40 feet deep. Um, they also did it on the back 40, right? Have you heard that term? Back 40 acres, as far away from the house as they could. And thirdly, they died all the time from those intestinal illnesses, from cholera, dysentery, typhoid, all of those illnesses that we have almost obliterated, not quite. But if you go back to that situation in a major event and disaster, when your immune system is already lowered because you're so stressed out, uh, we're going to bring those things back into our family, and it's going to be a really big problem. So, solution one, super bad idea, let's not do it. The second option that a lot of people think that they have that's a solution would be the uh, potty, camp potty, right? People say, well, I have a camp potty and bags, and we're going to be fine. We'll use that. I think that's one of the solutions I thought that I had. And we're just going to use that in a disaster. I hadn't really thought through, though, the fact that I needed a lot more bags than I had. Um, again, like we learned in part one, weeks to months without water in a large scale event or disaster. So how many bags do you have? What they did was they specially sized that little camp potty so that bags don't fit it, normal bags don't fit it. You actually have to go buy the brand name bag or the potty bags that fit it. You should never ever ever use your grocery sack that was free, your plastic bag that came home from the grocery store. Um, one, the plastic is way too thin, it's usually torn, there's holes in it. You do not want to put putrefied human waste in a bag like that. Recycle that for something different. Um, but Anyway, so you need a specially sized bag to fit a camp potty. Now, if you go to a camping store, somewhere where you can get those, you're gonna get a bag of about four to six bags for 12 to $14. To me, that's not really sustainable. I don't have that in my budget, right? So how many bags do you have? Uh, weeks to months? I don't know how many family, family, how many members you have in your family. How many bags do you need? We're gonna talk about trash in a little bit, bagging your trash as well, but for waste, you need a lot of bags. Now, once I had somebody say to me, I got thousands of bags. She was setting up a shelter in the city. I got thousands of bags, that's fine. And I said to her, well, that's great. What are you gonna do with the bags? She said, well, we're gonna pile them over here, right here, and we're gonna put them in this bigger bag, this dumpster bag. And I was like, okay, what are you gonna do when the dumpster bag is full? And she said, well, somebody's gonna come pick it up. Who's coming to pick up your bags? Um, again, we're gonna talk about debris management in a little bit, but I can guarantee you, your dump trucks that pick up your trash in your landfills will not accept bags of human putrefied waste. In a large scale event or disaster, they are highly regulated. Uh, your emergency response agencies that are coming out to help it, they're watching for those. They're not going to collect them. Now, we're getting better at telling people that you can't do that. If you look in your CERT manual, your Community Emergency Response Team manual, um, it will tell you, please keep biohazard bags separate from your regular trash without telling us what do we do with those bags. So my concern is that if you're bagging your waste, even if you're not separating it from your trash. I don't know what your trash can looks like if the trash man hasn't picked up in a week. At Christmas time in my house, it looks like Chernobyl, right? It's bad news. We produce a lot of trash. Uh, imagine weeks to months. So we anticipate that large-scale earthquake. Roads are going to be down and broken up. I am imagining that your trash man is not able to come to you for a while. Are they going to be working to restore that service? Absolutely. Are they going to struggle? Yes, they are. So how long are you going to go without trash pickup? And now you have a pile of trash with human putrefied waste in those bags. Even if you are separating it out from your trash, what are, what are people doing? Are they piling it out at their back shed? Are they piling it out at their fence? What are they doing with those bags of waste? And once they start to create those piles, do you think that the vermin care one minute about the bag? They're going to tear through those bags and make a huge biohazard pile in your backyard, which then brings in the vector-borne illnesses with the insects. You're going to have a very large biohazard in your yard. Even if you're burying those bags, those bags decompose faster than you would think. They're actually made of cornstarch, um, some of them, so that they can biodegrade faster. Uh, those liquids will then start to spill, start to create a sinkhole, start to contaminate your groundwater sources. It is a bad news to bag your waste. <laughs> what do we do now? Now, short-term disaster, sure. Short-term camping trip, great. Other issues where you're gonna evacuate, you're gonna be okay. If you're trying to stay in an environment and you don't have trash picking up, you got a problem if you're bagging your waste. Even if you do have trash picking up, they're not gonna take your putrefied waste. Um, so then we have another issue. 
Third thing people are going to do is they're going to say, it's okay, I have a travel trailer or an RV. I have a backup bathroom. Well, that's true. As long as the disaster is like two or three days, right? Like anybody that has one of those, we have one best purchase we ever made. Please don't be offended. I love our trailer. Um, but that tank lasts two to three days. Maybe a little longer if you're really conserving and depending on how many people are using it. But if you're in a large scale event in which the roads are not passable, um, uh, the water and wastewater isn't working, let me tell you what's going to happen real quick. When those tanks do get full, the dump stations are not open. Your wastewater companies shut those down. They lock them down. Or in an earthquake or a big land movement, they broke up and they are a mess. You can't even get there, right? Um, the other problem is even getting your trailer to those dump stations, right? Roads are down. Okay, let's say no roads are down. How much fuel did you store if you're experiencing water, wastewater, maybe power outage? How much fuel have you stored that you can regularly take that trailer back and forth to try to dump it somewhere? Um, so what happens is, and it's not a theory, in events this happens frequently, people will take their trailer and they won't be able to make it that far so they'll go to neighboring communities. They'll leave their community, their neighborhood, and they'll drive to the neighboring community and they will look for low-lying areas in parks and storm drains and gutters and they will dump their tanks in your community. And that even is going to dry up, it's going to create particulates in the air that are going to give you respiratory issues and pneumonia, it's going to cause an outbreak of disease if people are driving around and trying to dump their RV and trailer tanks. It's a really bad idea. So again, it's sustainability. How long can you last with that bathroom? What are you going to do when the tanks are full? Um, how are you going to empty it? Now, there's one last one, if you weren't scared enough already. The other solution that frequently people will say to me is that they have water stored for flushing the toilets. Your toilet is not powered by electricity. They're right. Okay, so what they say is, oh, you can take a cup of water, you dump it down the toilet, and you can flush, and it goes away, and no one ever thinks about it again. Um, I got a couple concerns with that. First of all, how much water did you store that you can literally flush it? Yikes. Um, okay, maybe you stored a lot, and you can, and you have a bunch. Well, one thing I want you to keep in mind is the fact that it's not going to take one cup of water. It is going to take a gallon or two gallons of water to move that waste as far away from your home as you need it to move. So let's reevaluate how much water you store. And remember, as we learned in part one, weeks to months without water in a large scale event. Now, um, here's my other problem with this situation. If you have a system of, of water pipes that are busted up and they don't have pressure, and you have a certain population of people that's flushing water down those pipes, um, that water's not making it back to water facilities. It's contaminating groundwater sources. Or it's going to go down just far enough till it gets to the next house, and then it's going to back up in your basement. It's going to cause minor or even major sewer backup in your basement. And what we learned in part one was the fact that if you have even an inch of sewage back up into your basement. You can't stay there any longer. You're a refugee. You can't say, well, our house is structurally sound and all our supplies are here, so we're staying and we have family coming. Now we don't go in the basement anymore because they're sewer. Sorry, it's stinky and shut the door and say we're done. Um, you can't do that because of all those contaminants that are going to bring disease and illness into your home. All those toxic gases, it is a really bad idea. And someone that's flushing water uphill from you, that's flushing that water into the system, is going to cause sewage backups in your basement. Now here's another problem with it. Let's say there was there that there's no breaks in their system, so they're not contaminating the line, right? Let's say in your area, the ground was pretty stable, and it is making it really far. Everybody knows that without being too crass, right, crap flows downhill. We've all heard that, right? Well, they're right. All of our sewer facilities, especially in our area, that's the ones I am a subject matter expert in, is the fact that our sewer facilities are, are built as low as they can be, right, at the lowest elevation. Um, for our system, it's a gravity-fed system. So everything flows down towards it. But here's what happens. When you're in your neighborhood, it flows away from your home, and it gets to a certain level where it's real low, and it doesn't have any more elevation to lose. So what they do is they build what's called a lift station. These are secured uh, areas in which it, there's a giant screw pipe. It's, it looks like a screw to me. 
um, it turns and it rotates, right? And it's hooked at the bottom of the, the pipe. So the pipe comes down with the sewage and this giant screw lifts it back up 50 feet, 60 feet. They're all different elevations. And then it continues on its way downhill. And sometimes between your house and a facility, there'll be two or three of those lift stations that keep that sewage moving. Those lift stations are powered by electricity. Uh, now they have backup generators, like I said, uh, those systems are really good, they have backup plants, they have redundancies, um, they have generators. They generally store enough fuel, however much the generator can actually handle, and then at a certain point, two or three days into that event, they're going to need more fuel. So depending on the scale of the event and the resources that are available to your community, they may or may not be working, right? And most of the time, especially if you don't have sewer at your house, that lift station isn't working. So what will happen is, let's say there's no breaks in the line and you're not backing up anybody's sewer yet. That sewage being introduced into the system with people dumping water into their toilets is going to flow down and get to that lift station that's not working. That's either broken or busted or no power to it. And that sewage is just going to come right back towards the homes that are closest to it. And it's going to just fan out from there. It's also going to overflow into rivers. Often those lift stations are above ground and they're not built in a building because hydrogen sulfide literally eat the cement out from around that building. So they build it open air, or sometimes people bury them, or communities bury them, but a lot of them are above ground. Regardless, that sewage is gonna go somewhere else, and it's gonna cause a community event. It's gonna impact your neighbors and those surrounding you, and it's gonna impact you. It's gonna cause, if people are just taking water and dumping it into their toilets and flushing it away into a system that's busted up, you're gonna have groundwater contamination. You're gonna back up in people's basements. You are going to have all kinds of health, environmental health issues if people are doing that. Um, I know this is pretty terrifying because if you're anything like me, when I was doing all this research and, and response training, I was thinking, all of my solutions are wrong. What am I gonna do? It's like a panic. I didn't, I didn't sleep very good that night. But honestly, the solutions are not rocket science. There's some really good, easy solutions if you're doing them properly. And most of those solutions that I like to give, uh, the, the supplies are just around your house. I'm not here to sell you anything. You don't need a specific system. Um, so we're going to talk about that in part three. I hope you stay with me. Um, everybody go take a deep breath, go pet your dog or your cat and come back and watch pet part three and we're going to talk some solutions. Thanks.